can I, I think, I, I think, I think part of it too is that, um, sorry, if I'll just, I'll just throw in a point as well. I think um, um, while there may not be um, specific equivalents from a, you know, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander liaison officer to a, a called liaison officer, I think from a statewide perspective, um, and, and I guess this is where consumers themselves have a lot of power and individual patients have a lot of power and control as well. So from a Queensland perspective, um, the workforce for Queensland Health should be reflective of the community. And what, to me, what that means is we should have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce of at least, you know, roughly 4%, because that's what the community is. We should have a called staff members, at least representative of the community. We should have disabled and uh, all the different groups should be fairly and equally represented in the workplace. So um, I, I know there's obviously funding issues and having dedicated positions for, for, for those kind of um, um, positions, but if the workforce is reflective of the community, I think I think that's where the that's where the advocacy can come in from a staff perspective. But I think from a patient, like I said, from an individual patient or community perspective, you know, this is what patients should be asking for. This is what I believe consumers should be asking for: a reflective workforce when they go to a hospital, a reflective workforce when they go to the primary healthcare sector. So, so for me, that's rather than dedicated, you know, because funding is always tight. There's never enough money to create new positions all the time. But I think that reflective practice diversity from the board to a nurse on the ward I, I think that's where that's where the winds are that's uh, one of the things I have I saw the presentations they did in this are these on? Uh, in this morning the presentations they, um, they they were presented the other countries they have uh, like working groups so health consumers yeah the resources so it's very important to for us to build that up if I can just um, just quickly add to Dean's point, a lot of the solutions, um, you know, we talk about high-level strategy documents that uh, are statewide documents. Some are produced by um, consumer groups. Some are produced by the Department of Health. They all talk about partnering. But at the end of the day, it, it, is, it, is, it does come back down to a local decision-making process. And you know, just recently in Cairns, they advertised a, a Chinese liaison officer position, which, which I thought was, I had to read it twice because I'd never seen that before. But obviously, there'd been some con consultation with the community, um, and the local um, board agreed, and the executive management team supported the development of that uh, the the point. Uh, the funding of that position. So really it comes down to local um, solutions and those are often driven through um, con con uh, community consultative committees. And um, I guess the, for, for today, the, we're, we're talking about how you increase the petition, participation and diverse views from, from a health perspective. Um, just to highlight, I think one of those is to increase the staff and look look at your staff and clinicians in, and, and look for the diversity. Um, there's your first port of call. So how do you engage with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the community? Start with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander staff. Um, th that would be that would be a solid start, I think. The, the other point is sometimes we need to look past the clinical model and we start to look at what uh, what other engagement strategies are required to get clear health messages to consumers across we, we, we look at um, the op we looked at a presentation this morning around the social aspect of delivering health messages so the more people that can engage on a social level and a cultural level um, you know potentially has uh, will produce better health outcomes. That would be really great for um, the consumers to work alongside with the clinicians. So that way they can give their perspective towards the clinicians. Another question? Yes, thank you. Uh, I've, 
I just want to give a kind of a background of why, where I'm coming from. Uh, you know, with some cult communities, especially the African communities, talking about mental illness is kind of a taboo. It's a, you know, they believe that it's a curse, and they don't want to talk about it. If you talk about it, you know, you'll be stigmatized. There will be discrimination. So, you know, sometimes even when you talk about just mentioning counseling, psychologist, psychiatrist, you're kind of blocking someone from the African community, like, no, I don't want to be involved in this. So is there a possibility that we can have services, like from uh, Queensland Health, that don't that are kind of user friendly, where people can just walk in, but you no, know, without people knowing that they are going there for this particular purpose. Because once you mention those, it's either they don't even go there, or if they do go there, they will be dis discriminated. We have um, transcultural mental health. We are, we have some sort of a um, program. Uh, one of the programs is the Brighter Future. That's for the um, for the children and the adolescents um, and uh, adults, a 18 and above. That's one of the programs we have. It's called Brighter Future. And another one, we got uh, stigma reduction plan. But we were really doing that program because we don't have no resources at the moment and no funding. So we, we are unable to continue that program. If we can get funding, we are more than happy to continue that program. It's called Stepping Out of the Shadow. That was a great, a great program for the um, coal uh, multicultural consumers and carers uh, to uh, reduce stigma. So that's the uh, at present because of no funding, we won't, we are unable to to run that program. Okay, and just in case you get more funding later on, yeah. there's also power in the types of words, the wording that you use when you want to, you know. Uh, bring services to the people because like I said in here if you just mention counseling or stigma and that because you know people don't have that much understanding of these words so if you just mention those words so what I'm asking for is like user friendly words you know like layman to use layman's language in you know you know you know you know what you want to address but without even mentioning it but targeting it, you know, providing services. For example, uh, well, it might go uh, to something different. Even when we, for example, when we want to talk about domestic violence in my organization, we say building stronger families. We don't even mention domestic violence, but what we want is to build stronger families. So that's something, that's what I'm talking about. So if I can, uh, 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 if I can just ask a question, it's a bit strange. A panel member asking the audience a question, but um, have have it sounds to me as though you you have probably got some of the solutions to providing a safe environment um, to discuss this type of issue. Would I be right in saying that? Okay, so I guess the importance is the engagement of the community, um, I mean the consumers, being able to share that information in a safe environment. Um, and I guess one of the models that we are trialling up in, in, um, in the Cairns Hospital and Health Services is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Community Consultation Committee specifically to do that. I guess it's a little bit, you know, whether or not uh, there's an, a, a cultural and linguistically diverse um, community consultative committee, I'm not 100% sure of, but that would be the place to raise those things. And I guess if there's just general community consultation committees um, that, that involve key stake, stakeholders such as Queensland Health and general community members, that would be the place that I would probably provide that sort of information too, so that some work could start to form around that space. I think the other thing too, I'll just add on to that as well, I think um, 
when you look at the um, minority groups, I guess, across Queensland, unfortunately, or fortunately, the, the way it is, you know, the 85,000 staff that work for Queensland Health, there's going to be a whole raft of uh, doctors and nurses and clinicians that um, uh, um, that are dealing with people from diverse backgrounds that they have no awareness of um, from their from their own perspective, from a cultural uh, viewpoint. And I think things like this you know, statewide capability um, program from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective and, and to, to make sure to get those resources available so when those issues are raised, um, the doctors, nurses, allied health professionals have got somewhere to go as a reference point or someone someone to go to as a reference point. And I think the, the reference groups are good. I think resources are good. I guess Dean's right. The idea of the, the, the pilot project or the project that we are implementing on Cairns is specifically to provide a cultural knowledge centre and improve the cultural intelligence of the organisation. So unless we get that information coming through, we can't embed those things into resource development, um, planning and, and funding models. So, Simon, I think we might have an answer here. I just thought I wanted to let you know that the MARTA Hospital have done an enormous amount of work in this space. Um, they actually have a group of eight African women leaders that they have been working with probably over the last four years. And they've um, trained in the Australian health system, but they've also been trained in consultation techniques within their own communities. They've gone out and done extensive consultations around cultural understandings of health, ways to engage with their communities, etc. Um, and they now um, make up the, I think it's called the Greater Brisbane um, Advisory Group Committee. It's quite a long term. Anyway, they are available for consultation either on an individual basis um, around their own um, culture or also as a group to talk about the cultures that weave in and out of the African communities here in Brisbane. Um, you can actually get hold of them via um, the... Uh, Centre for Innovation in Primary Healthcare at the MARTA Hospital. So please contact that group. They're an amazing resource. They also have an enormous amount of data around their own communities that you can build on for projects. Yeah, thanks, Ben. And, and those those points that get referenced, we'll try to um, um, get those get those put down and shared as well through for post the post the event today. Yep, thank you. Uh, uh, what that question before asked about the resources. I just want to give you, um, we collaborate with the other MDA and um, QPAS, we collaborate with them and so we build up um, to community leaders. So we have community leaders dinner and we bring the community leaders together. So we are, we are educating community leaders so that way they don't have that, even um, Sri Lankan culture, it's a taboo, like to talk about mental health. So it's the same as uh, African culture. So we, we bring together and have bring they, that way we educate them so they can go and talk to their own community. So that's, that's what we are doing at the moment. Hey everyone, my name is Hannah and I would like to ask this question to the uh, Aboriginal members of the panel, please. Uh, you've mentioned that the uh, mortality rate for children under the age of five has declined. Uh, well, we're still, we still have a, a big percentage, but it has declined in the past. And I would like to know what are the key factors that contributed to that, especially that you just talked about historical lack of trust and being treated differently when accessing health services. What the key factors that made mothers go, well, I'll put that aside and I will make it to the hospital. So how did that transition happen? Because I think we share that lack of trust in some cult communities. They don't have trust in the, in the, in the government systems in general due to historical reasons and being treated differently. There's a, there's Thank you. There's absolutely a number of reasons. Um, the health of the mother is one factor. The, um, and we have, a, we have a very young population and we have a lot of young teenage mums as well. 
and that history we have st I'm not sure everyone would be aware of stolen generations so we have a long history of children being forcibly removed and taken from us and that is still happening today so that is a very real real fear for particularly our young mums who are accessing services and I can say that even as myself I was a young mum and I definitely had that fear um, when I had my children and it was very real and um, you face those same sort of judgments when you get into a hospital setting. The other thing is that a lot of our young people because we've got a, a very young population and a lot of our elders and a lot of people who are sick we have a lot of kinship structures and roles and responsibilities and particularly for young mums we have that mother nurturing role where we have to look after our elders, our aunties, our grandparents and possibly a lot of other children along the way. So there's those cultural factors that we can't leave home quite easily to come in from different places and have the time to have the baby too. So, you know, going and accessing visits, there's financial demands, there's those kinship responsibilities, there's trust issues. There's, you know, let's face it, there is racism that occurs and there's stereotypes and there's judgments that's reconfirmed in the system, in the language, in the forms. Um, we have literacy issues, you know, and then you've got all the health issues with people with, you know, smoking and those sorts of things and not being in the best health. So there's a multitude of um, issues um, for young mums to actually leave their families or even older mums to come and have their birthing off country. And that also goes back to our spirituality. You know, we want to have our children on our country. That's very important. And for us to birth on country is very limited. You have to come into different facilities and be away from home or expect to be away from home four to six weeks. It's just, it's just not possible to do that. So that all contributes to why there's so many issues and why we have such large deaths, infant mortality between the ages of zero and five. Um, but in saying that, that has been a target and there has been a lot of work in getting those mums and bubs programs out and that does go to the fact that they're doing outreach, they're going out to communities, they're doing the right things with engaging people in their own place with the support of their elders and other aunties around and I think that's why some of those are, are working because they're working around what our needs are, what our cultural needs are. Um, one of the things that our job does is really about, yes, you can have the most fantastic clinical staff and that there, but if you don't put culture capability up equally with clinical capability, these statistics will not change. Mm. We're a spiritual culture, we're a relationship culture, we're tied to our land, we're tied to each other. And if that isn't incorporated into your healthcare for Aboriginal people, um, we're going to keep failing. If people don't understand how we perceive our health, what we think is going to make us better, and have an empowerment in that process, um, yeah, it'll just keep breaking down. Can, can um, I, if I just can add I to that, your question? that uh, as well. We often, in the current um, Queensland Health Key Performance Indicators around um, closing the gap and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health um, Key Performance Indicators, I think there's eight uh, in the Queensland Health System and five of those are all related to child and maternal health. Um, but looking at, um, we talked about young mums but we seem to often forget about young dads and family-centred um, care. Um, you heard my colleague Julie talk about um, kinship. Um, there's a lot of primary health um, work still to be done. Um, we, we went through a huge restructure uh, in 2012 where a lot of health promotion services were removed from uh, Queensland Health and they were expected to be picked they were expected to be picked up out in the uh, AMS world or Aboriginal medical service world um, or, or GPS without any funding um, so there's still a lot of work to do there but I just would like to say that it when you think of young mums, there are young dads 
and there are also kinship um, related issues that all um, align, have to line up to, I guess, to raising a healthy baby in an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family setting. Mm. And I think uh, just just uh, from my perspective and acknowledging uh, all those points as well, I think for me it's really around personal relationships and it's a, and today everyone's busy and there's a you know always more work to be done but actually taking the time to sit down and have a yarn with your patients have, take you know that that personal re relationship and that personal <coughs> connection still from a you know professional viewpoint i guess but but building that relationship um and again credit to credit to both teams um statewide for the cultural capability team out there building those relationships with clinicians and staff transcultural mental health doing the same thing uh, for a number of years and it's those relationships I think that come to the point is when you start looking at uh, one influencing national agenda to make sure that um, infant mortality um, is on the table and is important. It's the relationships that got that achieved um, from from way back. Um, and but I think also too is when it's time to implement and roll that out is the having the relationship with your patients to highlight how important it is to come in for five antenatal visits. What happens if your baby is low birth weight? What's the long term impacts on your family? and having the person to have the trust and respect, I guess, in your knowledge that they'll understand and, and you know, provide as much information as you can. But for me, from my perspective and from my teams and what I see from these guys, it's about the relationships that have been built over many years and it's the trust and respect for their roles when they, when they go out and do that stuff. That's what I'd say would be the, would be the big factor in, in those changing rates. Sorry, Lynn. I, I agree with what the uh, panel have said. Uh, my um, input, I heard you, heard you mention uh, resources, and I just wonder if the panel or whoever uh, knows about the um, resources from uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia and from Andrology Australia for uh, men's health and, and regarding um, prostate cancer and prostate problems. Um, there is resource material in uh, Torres Strait, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander languages. Uh, also with uh, um, Andrology Australia, they put out resources and uh, they also have a, a video, video uh, and I uh, put one out to um, Lancy Johnson in uh, Cambu up at uh, Ipswich and um, they, they are available from Andrology Australia, it's just a matter of, of bringing them or going online and ordering that for Torres Strait and uh, Aboriginal people and um, I'm not too sure about um, um, the other, I, I think Prostate Cancer Foundation of Australia, I think they put out uh, booklets and stuff uh, describing all the uh, prostate um, diseases and that uh, in other languages. I'm not too sure just what the languages are, but there's about four or five different languages there that they put out in that language. So maybe that is of help. I don't know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, I'm certainly aware of all those things from the Westmorton perspective. Passionate advocate out that way, that's for sure. Um, and and share. I, I, we can certainly share. Um, I, th I think. Can I just throw in? I think some of those resources. The value for me is that um, from some of the resources I've seen from Westmorton from the prostate cancer um, perspective, um, they're they're culturally relevant and useful for everybody. So rather than have a separate Aboriginal one, rather than have a separate Torres Strait Islander one, while you know for the, all the different language groups. It's, it, 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 Absolutely. Yep. Yes. So thank you. Thank you. Now, we've probably got time for one more question because it's getting into afternoon tea. And I, <laughs> that's good. Otherwise, we have to finish early. Yep. <laughs> Um, I'm probably
probably going to ask a little bit of a controversial question. So uh, recognising, um, acknowledging that I'm a white middle class Australian who's grown up in a very Anglo-Saxon community. Um, but I recently heard um, a presentation from a university in Darwin around community engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. And uh, they were talking about the need that in community engagement we do tend to spend a lot of time talking about um, being culturally appropriate and sensitive, and which is vitally important, but at some point you need to move on and actually get to doing the work. And I suppose my question or comment to the panel that I'd like to get your response on is about, you know, how do you how do you respectfully and, and appropriately, you know, put that point forward that, you know, we're all human and we're probably going to offend people at some point. Um, and we do that with, you know, the best intentions. And, um, you know, let's move forward and actually get the work done. I I, if I could just a, answer that quickly, I just want to... You've got them all ready. <laughs> yep. Um, in terms of moving on, um, it's pretty hard to tell somebody how, the, how long they can mourn for because their child has been taken away. It's pretty hard to, to let somebody know that... Um, uh, you know, a lot of you know when you when somebody's hurt, and, and some not just somebody, a community, a population is hurt. It's very difficult to tell someone, oh, it's time to move on. Um, that just doesn't doesn't um, fit very well in the way that you um, you deliver those messages. I guess it's not about being non-productive. It's all about being respectful, and. I guess in terms of getting on and doing what what has to be done, um, it's not all, always about what we learned about this morning about volume. It is about value and valuing people. Um, often we run our whole ship by performance indicators. Um, that's not always the best way to get the best health, health outcome and sustainable ones. So yeah, I'll just leave it at that because um, yeah, I could talk about that for quite a while. I think it, while we've got everyone here, I think everyone should have a voice in saying something to wrap up this session. But in terms of some practical tips that people can move forward, the first thing is absolutely taking time and building the rapport and really understanding the community that you're working with and making sure they do have a voice. Um, sometimes that means you're going to have to have a little bit more time for building that relationship because there's also decision making in there and that can take some time as well. So if you can be upfront with your planning and allow for those relationships um, to develop, that's when you'll get the best value because you'll be able to identify what terminology is appropriate, who are the key people that will be able to help you make those decisions and be the spokespersons for that particular uh, community. It'll help them to uh, articulate to you, this is what we need, this is how we think it should happen, this is the time frame that we know that we'll need, and this is what we want you to do with this information and give it back to us. Because essentially what you're doing is you're honouring and respecting our way, our decision-making processes, acknowledging our knowledge that we bring and the content and all that stuff that's based on our cultural beliefs. And so I know it does take time, but I can guarantee that if you can spend that time up front really breaking down those mistrusts and building those relationships and reports it's going to be worthwhile because you know community agent you just don't do something and then it you know and then it's gone if you can build those really good relationships with people and empower them, they're someone that you can always keep going back to because our community change over our leaders and our champions our old people change and new people step up so if you look at it in terms of value and relationships and rapport and really build that up front, um, I think that's the way to progress. They can tell you locally, we're too diverse to say this is the right way, but they will be able to say, don't use this language, don't talk to this person, this is the need that we have here in this particular community and what we see. I think if that's just some practical tips to go forward and, and really look on those people who are the spokesperson. You know, in Western systems, they tend to be people who are appointed or in, you know, you can say DG or anything, but in our community, it might not be the mayor, it might not be um, someone who's in a position, an AO8 or whatever, it could be someone else who's of high influence in the community and to look for those ones and the community will tell you who they are. 
Um, so I don't know if that answered your question, but that's way of progressing and really being careful with those in, sort of terminology about how do we move In on. saying that, um, you know, you, you would have recently seen, or you may have seen something in the papers or something in the news about Arakoon recently. The mayor and the community have taken, are trying to take control of that and stand up and do something about it. So, you know, as much re other government support, private non-profit support you can add, at the end of the day, when we're dealing with Aboriginal communities, Aboriginal people generally have the solutions and can drive those things. All they need to do is have people listen, respect, and trust and build that trust as, as what um, Julie's just said. Like the other panel members uh, mentioned, um, the, the, like all the uh, members who are sitting next to me, uh, as they mentioned, uh, we are better together. We can work together. We are better together. So we can build up that trust and the relationship um, in that I know it's professional level, but if you can build that and acknowledge and listen to them, uh, the, especially the multicultural um, people and Aboriginal, they like to to someone to listen to them rather than we are try we are without telling what to do to them. We should step back and listen to them. What 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 they have to say to them? What is their belief? What is their uh, perspective? So that way we will be able to work better together. Can I just add to that? Um, Julian, the panel have made some really good points, but I, I absolutely agree that the community protocol stuff and the cultural protocol stuff needs to be discussed. You know, it's it should be part of the negotiation. It should be part of the contracting. Um, and that's if you're dealing with Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander people or called nations. Um, if you think about, if you've entered someone's house, there's a certain way that they'll expect you to act or behave. Some of those protocols relate to um, standards. Some of those protocols are deep-seated in our myths and legends and our, our creation stories. That, that's how seriously we take them. Now, if you go up to the Torres Straits, we, every one of those islands is very protective and possessive about maintaining cultural heritage. We're a minority within a minority, but a very strong people that will tell you straight out, you've broken protocol, leave. So we need to be sort of mindful of that and respect that process of negotiating how we're going to work in with those communities. Yeah. Can I, uh, the other thing as well is I think I'd add, um, I, I guess, and I've heard this question a lot, and I'm sure all, all the panel has as well, that's why they all jumped in to answer so quick. Um, but I guess, I guess from my perspective as well is that um, as health professionals, for all the people that work in health organisations here today, is that it's, uh, 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 health consumers, Queensland's leading the way, um, pushing it through the Premier, but it's time that we as health professionals flip that over and say there is value. Make it a KPI. Make it reportable. Make it that, that, that we can report back that we spent X dollars and achieved these outcomes. And having a 4 a.m. Um, with elders in the, in, the, in, the, in the park isn't achievable. It is something that, that's of value and that needs to be done. So rather than look at it, this is just, again, from my perspective, rather than look at it, it is, is it what's, what, what points having a yarn and what points working? It's all working. And we need to sell that in the organisation and push it up to the bosses. Um, I'd even challenge that when we ask consumers from all back, uh, different cultural backgrounds to come in and provide advice, support their views, put their cultural um, uh, ideas on the table, we're actually asking some pretty challenging stuff. We're people, asking people to put their values and themselves out on the line, and it's, it's a fairly courageous effort. I would, would, would turn that around and say, as health professionals, we should be just as courageous in our workplace to say that's enough we need to make this of value for our consumers I, I, I guess sorry is this work um, I guess one of the other things is that when you come to a, a forum like this it's a testimony to just how far things are moving forward um, and congratulations to Health Consumers Queensland for actually getting a panel together like this so that it can be placed onto the agenda. 
uh, because it's not very often that you see what's in front of you. Um, and, you know, so forgive me if I'm grabbing the mic too much because I've got a lot to say because I've never been able to do this before. So it, it's a testimony to how far we've come as health service providers and consumers. What we don't want to see is the next time we're up here talking is that all we did was talk about it. What needs to happen is this is this same story, this same song, this same record's been playing for many, many years. We have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander national health strategy that was developed in 1989, and I could bring that up and there'd be still things relevant. But I'm not putting a downer on it. I'm saying look it around and listen to what's happening here today because this is a testament to how far we've come. And I guess it's whether or not people are going to stay on, on track and, and enter the journey into the future because we're at a point where we now have an opportunity to um, take this to the next level. We've got a minister that's put out a plan that's, that's, influ uh, that's encouraging this sort of um, change. And I, I, put, I put it out to you to um, help be part of those changes. So um, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to thank you for your questions. I'd like to thank the panel. Um, as we, the, it is an absolute panel of experts and we could talk a long time about this, um, but cake and coffee is waiting. So um, what I would suggest, and I hope I don't mind on behalf of the panel, is while we're having afternoon tea, if you've got those questions that you want to ask, grab them. Um, nicely, but come and grab them and ask the questions. I'm sure they'll have answers for you. Um, and I'm sure through Health Consumers Queensland, if you need to email after ask questions, I'm sure that'll be an option available as well. Um, I hope it was of value to you this afternoon and I hope it was useful. And thank you for, um, thank you for participating.